Well, at this point, people can go in two directions. There's one class of people who will say, all right, let's live the uncalculated life. Let's not make any plans. And before you know where they are, they're living in a filthy pad and uh, scrounging around and living on petty thievery and so on. This is the usual thing. This is uh, got into it the wrong way. The first thing to do is just as I said, whether you like it or not and whether you know it or not, the relationship between you and the environment is always one that is harmonious. So in the same way, you are always living the uncalculated life. And you have to find out, first of all, that you're always doing it. And that what you call your calculations and uh, the things you did were funny little rationalizations. In other words, your ego has about as much control over what goes on as a child sitting next to its father in a car with a plastic steering wheel that is turning the car the way daddy drives it. Because, as I pointed out, most of the functions, most of the goings-on, in you, around you, the circumstances of life, have nothing to do with your ego at all. And you don't even know why you make up your mind to do certain things. We know superficially, we have a few ideas. It's like when you uh, enter into a marriage, you have really no control over its outcome, in the ordinary sense of ego control. Uh, you've taken a colossal gamble, in which you've involved e enormous complexes of patterns. And maybe it'll come out all right if you don't interfere with it too much. <laughs> you don't. It's like Oppenheimer said, it's perfectly obvious that the whole world is going to hell. And the only possible way we might stop that happening is not to try to prevent it. And you know, all these wars are started out by people who think that they're helping someone. That uh, <laughs> it's going to make things better. So, when you begin from the basis, not of saying, I should now live the spontaneous and improvident and non-calculating style of life. But realize you've always done that, only you rationalized that you didn't. You always did what you wanted to do, basically. Only you said sometimes it was my duty. But you preferred a conception of yourself as someone who always does his duty. That flattered you. And so you were still following your own way. Now the first thing then is to see that, that that's what's happening. So that you don't think, well now there is some special thing I have to do to understand this harmonious relationship between the individual and the world. Because if you work on it that way, you will start from the presupposition that that relationship doesn't already exist and has to be brought into being. The thing is, it doesn't have to be brought into being. It's there. But now when you see that that's so, it obviously starts to make a difference. You do behave in a different way. But the behavior, the new kind of behavior that is a result of a transformation, is not forced behavior. When you try to imitate the way a saint behaves, you have made a forced change, and you know all forced behavior is phony. It's like someone saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, when you don't. You feel you ought to, but you don't really. And there's something that doesn't ring true. Or well, think of the poor Lord, 
listening to all the prayers of all those people saying, I love you, Jesus. And, they, and they, he knows they don't. <laughs> They're just saying this because they think they ought to. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they're very trying. <laughs> so whenever you do a thing like that, you see, you, you, you make a forced change. Now, if the change is to happen in the same way that a seed at proper season breaks open and sends up a shoot, see, it comes from the whole force of life itself. Now, when you see that without your having to do anything, see, you are living the uncalculated life, and you're only pretending you're calculating it and arranging it, then, as it were, you will have a grasp of the total situation, and it will, you can allow it to produce changes in action which are not forced. So this is why there is always a trend in every kind of spiritual doctrine which says something about grace, divine grace. There must come about something in you, a change, which you can't produce. And if you try to produce it, you will be a victim of spiritual pride. But on the other hand, all teachers are universally saying, you've got to make an effort. There is some discipline, there is some something you must do. Well, that's the only way to get it across to people. That you, as a separate effort maker, are a myth, are a phantasm. Because if you really try to control your mind and only think the thoughts that you think are good thoughts to think, you will find that you're going round in a circle. Krishnamurti is awfully good at pointing this out. When he, people ask him, how do you meditate? He says, why do you want to meditate? Why are you concentrating? Why are you saying prayers? Why do you think you should believe in God? And it always comes up because I'm just a son of a bitch. I mean, I'm out for my own good, and this seems to be the, be the way. So he says, you see, you don't have any genuine love at all. It's all fake. <laughs> and so you have to find, first of all, where the genuine love is. Now, you love you, don't you? That's genuine. We won't argue about that. But then, when you start from this, I gave a talk some time ago to um, the Air Force. They are <laughs> camp. A lab where they make weapons, do all the research. And they got a bunch of us there who were ministers and philosophers, and they had the nerve to ask us what was our basis for moral behavior, personal moral behavior. Well, I said, my basis for moral behavior is pure selfishness. And uh, I'm talking, after all, to realistic people here, and I don't think we need to be sentimental and beat about the bush. After all, you're all warriors and fighters and so on, and uh, you know how rough things are. So um, uh, I'm going to say to you, frankly, uh, I'm out for me. But of course, I don't do it in a tactless way. <laughs> I don't go around and hit people over the head and say, give me this, give me that. i much more subtle. I say, good manners and please and uh, how nice you all are and so on and finally uh, people feel uh, massaged psychologically into a state where they'll give. <laughs> but then I said after that there's some things that bother me. The first one is if I love me what do I want? And furthermore who am I? Because if I'm going to be realistic about getting what I want, I've got to be pretty sure what it is that's me and what is the state of desire in me. If I am desire, see, if I am a center of desire, what's it all for? Well, I think of all the things I want. Well, it so turns out that none of them are me. See, when I say I want dinner, that doesn't mean I'm going to eat me up. If I... Any pleasure I can think of, 
is the enjoyment of something that I hadn't thought of defining as myself. Of course, I like my sensations. I like what happens to my body when I take a fine wine and down it. But then what's the difference between my body and the wine? If I say I like the wine, I also mean I like me and the wine together, the mixture. But then I don't eat you or a friend or a lover in the same way as I drink wine. I live in association and like this. But then I'm loving things that aren't formally supposed to be me. And as I go into it, in other words, as I investigate what I mean by me, I find that I can't put any limits on it. That I cannot experience me without you or without the other. And they're inseparable. But you don't find this out until you investigate it. Until you really go into the question, what do I want? And that's the most important investigation anyone can make, which I'm going to into in the next session. Uh, the question of power. And all these military men, you think they, they think they want power. And so I said to them some very subversive and undermining things uh, without anybody knowing it until long after I'd left. <laughs>